rail system in Savannah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we're very glad that you found your way into this room in this cavern of the Capitol Visitor Center. Anyway, we welcome you to this briefing this afternoon uh, to talk about transit, a very, very important issue, certainly for EESI and I think for all of you. And of course, our topic today in terms of looking at public transportation, investments in public transportation, how it makes a difference in terms of local economies, and as we are looking at the great conversation all over Capitol Hill about the increase in, in uh, gasoline prices and what that means for everyone's constituencies and what is the role of transit in terms of thinking about all of these topics in terms of investments, in terms of economic development, and indeed in terms of higher gasoline prices. And how does all that come together? And of course, I find it quite amazing that as we are gathered here right at this very moment, the transportation bill is on the Senate floor and there are amendments after amendments that are being offered this afternoon. And as that bill then comes to closure, it will be taken up by the House um, in terms of maybe there will actually be a transportation bill. What a concept, right? Since we know that, that uh, the Congress has has struggled uh, to come up with a transportation bill, and that there have been uh, there have been numerous numerous extensions in terms of this very very important piece of legislation, which governs so much of how we move things in this country. So we are delighted to have the panel of speakers that we have this afternoon. Uh, we think that they will bring all of us some very, very interesting uh, examples and stories about the whole role of transit, uh, what it really means, uh, and, and the significance of it as, again, we look at this very, very important uh, policy issues before the Congress with regard to the transportation bill. Our leadoff speaker this afternoon is Gary Thomas. And he is the chair of APTA, of the American Public Transportation Association. And his day job, however, is as president and executive director of DART, the Dallas uh, Area Rapid Transit System. He has been president and executive director of DART since August 2001, after having joined the Dallas system in 1998. He brings a background in engineering and also in architecture. And as the lead for DART, he has been responsible for a 13-city transit system that covers a 700-square-mile area with bus, light rail, commuter rail, paratransit, and HOV, high-occupancy vehicle lane services. So he has overseen the expansion, the very rapid expansion, of the light rail system in the Dallas area, and that is now the largest in the country. Gary was elected chairman of APTA this past September after having served as vice chair, and he has also, over prior years, served APTA in many different capacities. And so we are very, very glad to welcome Gary. Good afternoon. Yeah. Carol, thank you so much. Uh, to you and the Environment Energy Study Institute for allowing me to be here this afternoon and talk a little bit about what's, uh, what's going on in our industry, certainly from uh, American Public Transportation Association's perspective, as well as from Dallas Area Rapid Transit's perspective. You know, we just, uh, we're kind of on the tail end of our legislative conference that we have every year. And about four years ago, I think it was, we started talking about the next authorization. We didn't want to say reauthorization. It was the next authorization because we really saw that as, as a, a, a real shift in transit financing, transit funding, transit uh, policies. And so we started working on that process about two years before the bill ended. The bill ended in September 2009, right? And we were ready. We were ready to go. We were ready for the new bill. We were ready for things to happen because, because people around the United States are looking for good choices. 
right? Because if you don't have a choice, I can guarantee you people won't get on the bus, on the train, if it's not there. You got to have good choices. You got to give people good choices, and that's what it's all about. So, so we started that process four years ago, and lo and behold, September 2009 came, and it didn't happen. And September 2010 came, and we're not quite there yet. So here we are, and the great news is, the great news is everybody's talking about transportation. So you go on the hill, and, and it, it is absolutely true. Everybody is talking about transportation, and that's the good news. We just need to make sure that we're talking about it in the right way because it's critical, it's critical to people throughout, and I'm not talking about agencies or businesses, I'm talking about people that ride the system every day. It's critical to them that we continue to stay focused on what we're doing, that we continue to provide good transportation choices to the people in the United States of America. So we, personally, I showed up last Wednesday to have the opportunity to talk to, uh, to, talk to the, our members and our delegation uh, within our service area. It's nine folks, including our two senators. And they're very, very supportive of DART. They're very supportive of what we do. And if you're saying, you know, well, what, what are they? Are they Republicans or Democrats? We have uh, eight Republicans and one Democrat in our delegation. And they're all, they're all supportive of what we're doing. Uh, sometimes we just have to make sure, just like all of us do, we have to come up and we have to make sure they know what we're doing, uh, the good things that are happening, because they're busy. They got everybody in and out. Have you ever sat outside a congressman or woman's office and watched the amount of people? And some of y'all uh, work for, for congressmen and women, I'm sure, so you know. But, but there's a lot of people in and out of their offices every day, so we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to make sure they know what we're doing. They know what's happening in their district from our perspective. And then they know the impact that we're having on their constituents. And that's what they want to hear. They also want to hear how they can help us. And that, so that's our job to make sure that we convey that message. Now, as we had that conversation last week, it was pretty amazing because as we went into those offices, everybody knew, everybody knew where the transit community was. They knew that we wanted a long-term bill, and they absolutely knew that we wanted the transit account left intact. Because you might remember at the beginning of February, there was a lot of conversation about maybe we didn't need the transit account being left intact. And people throughout the country said, no, that's not a good idea. We don't buy into that. We strongly think that the transit account needs to remain part of the Highway Trust Fund. That 2.86 cents needs to continue to go to transit. And they heard us. They heard all of us. I mean, it was again, it just wasn't us, the transit agencies or the business members. It was our stakeholders. It was the business community throughout the United States. It was our customers, the people that ride the system, as I said earlier. So. That's the good news. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody knows where we are. The Senate bill, uh, our, I don't know if, it, if it's going to pass today or tomorrow, but I know as we talked to our senators, they said we feel fairly confident that it's going to pass this week. The Senate bill is going to do something this week, and we're, we're excited about it. The House is on recess this week, and I know, I know when they come back next week, they're going to be very focused on transportation and doing something next week. And why is this important? I mean, I think we all know in this room why it's important, but, but just in case, it's because our economies, our economies in each one of our communities throughout the country is dependent on transportation. It's dependent on good transportation. It's about getting people and goods and services to where they need to be, from where they are to where they need to be. So it's absolutely critical. So again, why does it matter from, from a, a transit and a transportation standpoint? You know, I, I have to tell you that uh, APTA just announced this week that ridership, ridership is up throughout the United States. It's up 2.3% throughout the United States, 10.4 billion trips this past year on transit. And that's before gasoline prices were really starting to go up. That's the second highest it's been in, in the last 50 years. It's peaked in 2008 
remember what was happening in 2008, gas prices were what? They were $4 a gallon. And then uh, the economy hit us, and so it, it, uh, it, it went down a little bit, but now it's back up. And it, it's the second highest it's been in the, in the last 50 years. As a matter of fact, every weekday, just think about this, every weekday there are over 800,000 more boardings a day, every day on public transportation than there was a year ago. 800,000 more boardings a day in the last year. That's pretty incredible. So there's a lot of people, 10.4 billion trips a year. There's a lot of people looking for transportation choices, a lot of people trying to figure out how to get out of their cars off the highways and do all the right things for all the right reasons. And we were talking about this this morning. You know, a lot of people, uh, when they think about public transportation, they think, well, it's about getting from point A to point B safely, efficiently, and effectively, right? Well, it's also about congestion mitigation. If you're the one that's driving on that highway with all those other cars around you, you want those cars to go away. You wish all those other people would ride transit. And that's okay. You know, quite frankly, that's okay. What we have to do, though, remember, is provide the choice. It's about air quality. It's about transit-oriented development. It's about those development opportunities around stations but generally, if you talk to someone about why they ride transit, it's quicker, it's less expensive, it's easier, and it, it gives them that opportunity to check their emails to and from work, which is much, much safer if you do it on transit than if you're driving. Uh, tr trust me, <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, or you can read a book, take a nap, whatever you do. But as our country continues to grow, we've got to we've got to provide those transportation choices throughout the country. You know, I was watching the, uh, the news, Diane Sawyer's uh, ABC News last night, and there was a, a teaser that came on and it talked about high gas prices and it talked about transit. And I said, oh good, so I'm texting Michael Milanofi, the president of APTA, and I'm texting him, Michael, there's a story on ABC News, Diane Sawyer, they're gonna talk about transit and high gas prices. And then they did the story, and they talked about high gas prices. And I said, wait a minute. I know I saw the teaser right. It talked about transit and high gas prices. But when they did the story, it was about high gas prices. We all know about gas prices. We all know where they are. I don't know where they are in D.C. I know in Dallas uh, they're high. Uh, they're higher than we want them to be. And people are looking, at, you know, they're looking for what? A choice because now people are starting to have to decide, do I fill up my car? Do I pay the rent? Do I buy groceries? I have to start making that decision. Gasoline is that expensive. I have to start making that decision. I have to decide what, what I'm gonna spend my money on. So as I watched the news last night, I thought, gosh, we're missing this, this whole concept. We've got a great solution a great solution to high gas prices and we kind of talk around the fringes of it you know we're close we get the words out of our mouth but we're not quite there we, we haven't quite made that that whole leap yet to get out of the car in Texas get out of your truck <laughs> get on transit that's what it's all about that's what our job is that's what we have to do as we continue to make this push throughout the country. So as we look at our long-term solutions, as we look at uh, all the different opportunities, we have to look at transit as part of the solution. Of course, it's not, it's not the only tool in the toolbox. We all understand that. We have to look at more efficient cars. And you know, quite frankly, we're less dependent on foreign oil today than we were than we used to be, and that's a good thing, and that's a good news, but we're not there yet, and we know that every time someone blinks somewhere in the world, gas prices can do crazy things. So as we continue to march forward, as we continue to do things, we have to, we have to create those choices. We have to have the balanced approach to giving people a choice on their transportation needs. You know, and you may say, Gary, what do you know about transportation from Dallas, Texas, for heaven's sakes. What do they do in Dallas? 
Well, let me tell you just real quickly what's going on in Dallas, Texas, if you're not familiar with it. Now, Michael Jones sitting up here, he knows. He's from DART. He can tell you all. If, if, if I don't answer your question, ask Michael. He can tell you all about it. We started in 1983, so we started a little bit late. Now, that's not to say we didn't have public transportation in Dallas prior to 1983. We all had public transportation throughout the country. started in the late 1800s, and we had a streetcar system. We had the, the interurban system. As a matter of fact, in the 1940s, you could go all over North Texas on transit, right, just like you could in many parts of the, of the uh, country. And then everything changed, and we know that. And uh, so we kind of got back into the picture in 1983, and we're, you know, we have a 1% uh, dedicated uh, sales tax to help fund it. And right now, where we are in our system in North Texas is we can't build the system fast enough. Now, what do we have? We have 72 miles of light rail. We actually have the longest light rail system in the country. Who would have thought in North Texas you'd have the longest light rail system in the country? We have 16, I mean, I'm sorry, 19 more miles under construction. 14 of that will open this year. We'll be at the airport in 2014, and I've got another three or four miles that people are saying, Gary, we know it's scheduled for 2019, but we want you to get it to us by 2015-16. Uh, you, you know, so, so oh, and of course, that's in addition to, and we should never forget the fact that we've got a fleet of about 650 buses. We have HOV lanes. We have a commuter rail system that we jointly operate with the T in Fort Worth. We have uh, the, the uh, mobility management, uh, on-call service, all, van pools, all the different things that so many of the systems around the country do. We offer all of those systems, all of those things. Again, it's about a toolbox of choices. It's about giving people a choice, right? It's not about saying you have to drive on the highway, you have to drive on the toll road, you have to do this, you have to do that. It's about giving people a choice so then they can make that choice. The, uh, and for all the right reasons and all the reasons that I said before. But our challenge, as I said, is we can't do it quick enough. Now, the next part of that challenge is we need funding to make that happen. Now, we have a dedicated 1% sales tax, and that's a good thing, and we overmatch our federal grants, and, and you know, we've taken advantage of the New Starts program. We've taken advantage of the R program and the Build America program and, and the uh, Tiger grants, and we're going to be doing a TIFI loan. And so we're taking advantage of every single opportunity that's been presented to us, and we can't get it done quick enough. But let me tell you what, if we don't have a transportation bill, if we don't have a well-funded, long-term transportation bill, I can't plan those next projects. I can't get those next set of projects done. I can't continue to provide the transportation choices for the people in our area. And that's the challenge. That's why we're here. That's what we're talking about. And the good news is everybody's talking about it. We have to have a long-term, multimodal, well-funded bill with the transit account intact so we can continue to plan, so we can continue to provide those choices. Because again, if you don't have a choice, I guarantee you, you won't get out of your car. It's as simple as that. Thank you very much for the time this afternoon. I look forward to answering any questions later. Great. Thanks very much, Gary. And, so, and I must say, it's really interesting hearing the story about Dallas um, and, and in terms of the huge growing demand that you are seeing there. And I think that it uh, points up also um, uh, sort of an interesting juxtaposition in terms of thinking about uh, a little bit about what our next speaker is going to talk about. Because while we're seeing growing demand in places like Dallas, we also see the value that that brings to so many of the neighborhoods in terms of local economic development and what that really means. And so now we will hear from, from Nat uh, Bodyheimer. Did I get that? I, okay, I am so impressed I got that right. Uh, who is the Assistant General Manager for Planning and Joint Development with WMATA with the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. 
And Nat uh, is a transportation planner who specializes in the coordination of transportation service and infrastructure planning with local economic and real estate development. And we clearly see all of that here in the Washington area for all of us who faithfully ride Metro every day. And at Metro, Nat oversees the agency's long-range planning, real estate, and parking functions. And prior to joining Metro, uh, Nat worked for the Maryland Department of Transportation where he uh, was part of a group that oversaw uh, uh, the looking at land use coordination as a way to really improve transportation around the state. Nat. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this forum. Um, some very exciting work. We're very interested in, in sharing it uh, far and wide, so uh, I hope you find it as, as interesting as we do. So the story on this begins about five years ago uh, when we did some long-range forecasting of demand in the region and concluded that in the year 2030, plus or minus, uh, we would no longer have the capacity to be able to move people to and through the core of our system. And so that begged the question, well, what are we going to do in, you know, in 2030, plus or minus? Um, we need to put together a, a regional transit system plan uh, and start evaluating uh, uh, different alternatives for how we're going to uh, be prepared for that time. 20 years is, you know, is not at all too long to, to, to be thinking about that kind of challenge. And uh, the recognition at that time was really, you know, anything that we talk about is going to have a big price tag associated with it. And what we didn't want to happen was to have just a huge number of land in a region that is already thinking about the, you know, the, 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 the critical state of good repair needs that are already a, a real challenge for us to meet um, because the first reaction is going to be, you know, there's no way we can afford it rather than the alternative reaction we'd like people to have, which is that we can't afford not to. Uh, so the question was really how do we, how do we get to that place? And uh, so we wanted to step back and start thinking what do funders care about? Why do they, why do they make the investment in transportation? Um, we're, as, as transit agency managers and operators, we're disciplined on a daily basis to really think about engineering and operations. We want to do the same thing tomorrow that we did today, matching operators to equipment that works. Uh, and even though we may have a really good idea of what's in our strategic interest, it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the top thing on our to-do list each day. Uh, so it takes a lot of effort to kind of carve out some space where you can actually look at it the way funders look at it and think about the things that it does for a community in terms of affordable housing, in, term, in terms of improving the fiscal performance uh, of, a, of a local government, in terms of creating a positive business environment. So, uh, I, yeah, I will. I'm, I, uh, long introduction and then quick race through slides and show sure things. Um, and... We wanted it to be as compelling as possible, and we, we didn't think that we could really make the case by linking those economic benefits to uh, a sort of notional expansion plan. So we really wanted to, 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 to refer back to the experience because it's, you know, at this point it's a, it's a large, mature system. Um, we have um, you know, 86 stations, 103 miles of, of, of track. We have you know, uh, 1,400 buses and 1.2 million riders a day. Uh, there's something we can say about the impact, and so we wanted to we wanted to look back and, and measure what our impact in the region had been. Carol referred to um, some of the impact, the effects we've had in the region. Oops, sorry. I talked about that. There we go. So this is Boston, Boston in 1980. First, a quick question: How many people actually are here from the D.C. region? Just so I can. Okay, so when I say Boston, people know pretty much. I hope. I'm going to make that assumption. So this is Boston in 1980. This is Boston today. Uh, actually, a decade ago. It, 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 uh, it still looks more or less like this, but more. Um, so the question is really, well, what is this, what is this delivering? And the, you know, the next question really for us was, uh, so having gotten some training as an economist, you know, I, I know enough about uh, doing a pure analysis to know that... Um, it doesn't, it's not easily communicated. So we wanted to break this down into things that people really cared about and things that people could understand. Um, we also wanted things that were easily measurable because we didn't have time for a PhD thesis. Um, and we knew we were going to have to do things like measure counterfactuals because uh, we just knew that we were going to have to test. We could measure what's there, but we also had to do some kind of a job of, of estimating uh, what would happen if it, if it weren't there. Um, 
the way we did this work is we wanted it to be replicable uh, around the country, um, but we wanted it to be specific to the DC region. Um, so we worked together with, uh, with AECOM as, to do sort of the technical heavy lift and have the technical expertise to do this work, but we also wanted to pair with Smart Growth America, which is an advocacy organization, partly because we wanted to make sure we had the end user perspective. Um, they're closer to the ground in terms of what people want out of transit. And we also wanted that communicability. We wanted them to be able to sort of advertise around the country and, and, and shop something around the country. Um, I also just want to say just a few words about limitations. This is, we didn't want to get an exact number. We wanted to get order of magnitude numbers. We know that, you know, the annual capital expenditures for the system are about a billion a year, that the operating expenses are about 1.6 billion a year. We wanted to see what the benefits were from a capital point of view to sort of look at our cap, uh, the, the comparability of total impacts now versus con system construction cost. And we also wanted to see what kinds of recurring benefits there were and kind of compare them to our order of magnitude of operating costs. We really wanted just to sort of say, you know, is it bigger than a bread box for us? Is it bigger than the bread box for the benefits? And, you know, we were hoping that the, the results would be robust enough that someone would say, okay, these, these are motivating. We can take a, a, you know, sharpen the pencil for them. But I don't want anyone to think that these are exact numbers. And also because we're going to be looking at a couple different scenarios, I don't want anyone to think that they can all be added together because they can't. Um, and other, one other caveat I guess I'll make is that it's, it's a, this is a rail-oriented or rail-emphasizing presentation. More work needs to be done on the business case for the benefit of buses in regions, buses, the benefits of paratransit. We've been focused in the D.C. region on real estate impacts because that's something that's really noticeable here. But there's a business case for, for paratransit, just as there is for any other kind of transit. Um, you just have to identify who it is who is benefiting from the service. And so you may think that 30 or $35 per trip is expensive, but somebody does not have to provide life, you know, whole life support for somebody who now has a job. And so somebody is not incurring expense to su support the life and lifestyle of a mobility challenge individual, and that might be uh, that a small number compared to the, or that might be a large benefit compared to the transportation cost. So there are, I, I just want to emphasize the business case is something that can translate to all forms of transit, not just, um, not just heavy rail or transit-oriented development. So here's some of the, the, the initial findings. A couple of years ago, people were asking us, well, what, what's, what do you think the, the real estate impact is of your systems development? And at the time, we said maybe $25 billion. And they said, well, how do you know that? And we said, somebody said it last year. And so it was, um, uh, that wasn't really enough definition. So we've assembled a, a database of all properties, uh, assessors' information around the region. The answer is it's $235 billion worth of real estate value within a half mile of our stations, um, $112 billion within a quarter mile. Uh, of the value that is was measured, we thought about 10% of that, 7 to 7 9%, depending on the location, was directly related to transit. Uh, that's 28% of the region's real estate value on 4% of its land. Uh, and it generates $3 billion a year in property taxes. And there's a whole other suite of taxes as well that go to, to different levels of government. Um, f as far as m moving the regional economy, we, uh, we did another test where we turned off transit in the regional travel demand model uh, because we wanted to see what happens when it's gone. And without transit, peak travel times in the region increased by 25 percent for the total region, which imposes a total of about $1.5 billion in additional costs on the regional on an annual basis. Again, this is a modeled result, not an actual result, but it gives you an idea. And that's one of those things where I was talking about comparability. Our annual budget is $1.6 billion we're seeing a kind of a comparable level of benefit in the region on a recurring basis. Another thing we see is that people stopped traversing the region. They stayed in their own part of the region. Um, and so you see the region's economy fracturing, uh, which is a weakness for the competitiveness of the regional economy. Um, if you add back road infrastructure in order to replicate the levels of service that you see on the, on the system today, um, what you see is you get another thousand, you need another thousand lane miles of radial and circumferential roads. Um, the result of that is another million automobile trips per day, uh, eight million vehicle miles traveled per day. 
the equivalent of two new capital beltways, uh, four to six new lanes crossing the Potomac. Just the construction costs are $6.7 billion of that. And that's an average construction cost for an average facility. It doesn't recognize any of the extraordinary construction costs of building in such a tight urban environment um, or the cost of acquiring land. The other thing that occurs is that you need 200,000 new parking spaces in the core of the city, which is 166 square blocks of five-story parking garages, which is what this image shows. And that's basically from the mall up to north of DuPont Circle. So, I, you know, that's one of those counterfactuals that can't really exist because no one would come downtown for the 200,000 parking spaces, even though you could be sure you could get a parking space. Um, and so then, of course, there's sort of that question, well, is this so far-fetched and are we making something up that's really just sort of, a, you, know, a, you know, a boogeyman? Uh, and this is uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul. And just to show you that a downtown can be covered in parking, uh, that's an example. Um, one of the issues associated with that really as well is not only is there the, the capital cost of paying for all of that transportation and parking infrastructure, but there's also the opportunity cost of all of that economically productive land that has to be taken away in order to, to create space for that. Again, there's also issues of livability. Um, this is a, um, a graphic demonstrating, portraying a couple of what are now very vibrant downtown neighborhoods. An original transportation plan uh, from the 1970s shows a freeway and an interchange going right through the heart of, of the city along K Street. This area here in Mount Vernon Square has the City Vista development, and uh, that would be unrecognizable today. The, 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 the activity just simply wouldn't exist. Um, two more slides. This is uh, a, a graphic that just represents from the D.C. region the association of, of um, transit use in a census block group or a census, census geography with the total housing and transportation uh, expenditures. And what it basically shows as, as the transit mode share increases in an area, the total housing and transportation cost for a, a household goes down. That equates to more household spending power and you know, a greater strength for the jurisdiction in which that household lives. The more spending power that a household has, uh, I think just the more robust that jurisdiction is going to be. So the last is the wrapping up slide is really uh, just to make a couple of points that mobility metrics, which are the kinds of things that as operators and engineers we tend to emphasize, don't tell the whole story. Um, transit investment adds value that goes way beyond those individual, those metrics that we do rely on to, to, to describe the quality of our service. Uh, and that I, we think that adding this kind of analysis to the way we talk about what we do really strengthens the case for transit, makes the business case for transit. And using that vocabulary of business case, I think, is just a, even if people don't hear those numbers, talking the language of the people who fund us is helpful in making them feel that we understand what it is that they need to do. And that, I think, makes them more receptive to the case we have to make. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nat. We wanted to uh, look at a variety of situations with regard to transit because every part of the country is different and we have lots of different kinds of communities that have different kinds of needs. We've you know, had people now from two really large metropolitan areas, but we now are going to turn to Tony Thomas who is the chairman of the City Council of Savannah, Georgia. And which is another wonderful and very historically important city. And I think that Tony brings another whole perspective uh, that's very important in terms of sort of looking at, at uh, not, from, not only from Savannah's point of view, but also from the leadership that he provides through the National League of Cities. Uh, Tony was elected to the uh, Savannah City Council in 1999 and he was elected chairman of the council in, in 2005. And he has served on numerous boards in the city of Savannah, including United Way, the YMCA board, and I think also very importantly is the council's liaison for Savannah's development and renewal authority. But in conjunction with the leadership that he provides to the National League of Cities, he is um, vice chair of their leadership training institute and has 
uh, been on the Community and Economic Development Steering Committee for the National League of Cities, another whole very important group of cities that oftentimes I think are overlooked because we so often are focused on the really, really large cities. Tony? Thank you. First of all, I just want to say that I um, love listening to you guys and as to Nate for the met with the Metro, I look at it like a theme park being able to come up here and ride that Metro. That's a real fun experience for a guy. $50. You know, you got to realize just a couple of hundred years ago, it took us 12 days to get to you when we had to do business up here. So y'all could make a lot of decisions before all of that. My, um, my thoughts today that I wanted to share with you are... I don't want them to um, upset anyone, but I'm bringing you a different perspective of transit. Um, we, uh, being small cities, um, don't have, many of our cities don't have light rail. Other than Atlanta and Georgia, there's no system that's outside of buses, paratransits, and for Savannah, we offer water taxis. But I did want to just uh, bring and share a few things uh, with you. It is my pleasure to be here and have this opportunity to talk with you today. I wanted to talk a little bit about the link of public transit to economic development and the things that we've been working on down south. Uh, for me, public transit's near and dear to me. First of all, I have, you know, first of all, I'm the chairman of the city council in Savannah. And as an elected official for 13 years, it's been something that's always been on my plate. You know, we've had our demands, um, although the county and the cities are structured differently um, in Savannah, uh, in Georgia. Uh, the, uh, the responsibility lies with the county, but the city does participate in the funding and the responsibility of it. A second reason is I own a company called Renaissance Marketing, and we are engaged with transit authorities across Georgia. We're the largest transit advertising firm in the state of Georgia. So I have an opportunity to work with many of the leaders in the transit industry uh, throughout our state, and uh, it's really opened my eyes to the different levels uh, of challenges and opportunities that we face. Um, in my opinion, the greatest challenge that public transit faces today in Georgia and across America is the image of public transit. Citizens need an understanding and appreciation of what mass tr public transit is, what the possibilities are, and what it could become. Then I believe once you get that message across, you can get a buy-in and create the real argument and fight for the real funding to create this change that we all want. Um, I come from a railroad family, 325 years. Um, my family has worked with the railroad and watched it change. We forged the West. Um, that's, you know, that's the original public transit right there is when you're connecting the East to the West. And somehow, somewhere, that was a glory age of connecting all of it. And somewhere it got lost. I, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, I look back on historical accounts in the year 1900, there were articles written um, by a, a visiting uh, New York editor who said that the city of Savannah had a rail system that was uh, equal to that of New York City. But somewhere in the 1950s, Detroit came along, offered all kinds of discounts to go to buses, and the rails got covered up, taken down, and we became a bus system at that point. Now, I say all of this to you because one of the greatest possibilities for public transit is its connection to local economic development. In Savannah, we have Chatham Area Transit, which operates a bus system and a water taxi operation. Um, for those of you who don't know, Savannah is one of the largest ports in the United States. So we have a river. Part of our city is divided by that river, so we have to cross that river so we have, ship, we have captains that taxi folks across the river to our trade center, which is on the opposite side of where our core of our city is. So that's where the water taxis come in. Our system, like some of the others, have seen a 22% increase in ridership this year alone. Much of that attributed to gas prices, but also we have um, our executive director, Dr. Chad Reese, sees the connection between economic development and the need for public transit. Our system's countywide, but it is, is forced to engage in negotiations with eight different municipalities. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. That's eight different mayors and eight different city councils that have to be pleased in order to bring public transit into their 
municipalities. Not an easy task for anyone to do. For a variety of reasons, some of these municipalities have chosen not to have public transit. In doing so, they hinder economic development in their communities and put a strain on local employers and industries that are looking for a reliable workforce. Recently, just a couple of weeks ago, JCB, an international heavy equipment uh, firm in Savannah, cited that 25% of their employee turnover was due directly to transportation issues, issues related to getting workers to the site. That's 25% that's costing this company millions um, to get a qualified workforce to them because of the lack of, uh, of public transit. And it's significant because companies that are looking at locating to our industrial mega site, we have a thousand acre industrial mega site at the intersection of I-16 and I-95, have no public transit in place to provide for manpower issues that has a direct correlation to the possible development, in some cases, the slow development of this prime site, possibly one of the most prime in the south in the state of Georgia with its proximity to the port of Savannah, the fastest growing container port on the east coast of the United States. Another example I want to cite is Gulfstream Aerospace, makers of the fastest business jet in the world. They are based in Savannah. While Gulfstream is located in, on, on the verge of our city limits, it's in an area that has no public transit service. Dr. Reese has reached out to Gulfstream to begin talks on how to provide services to Gulfstream. They have indicated to us that they have 8,000 employees and vendors who work between their campus facilities daily. So the challenge is, is bringing the system in and making it work when municipalities won't vote for the taxing districts that's needed. So uh, this is one where you, you have to think creatively and reach out and do things that you typically aren't under the control of the government itself. Um, the, additionally, in the city of Savannah, we have just engaged and finished a two-year feasibility study of a viable uh, cruise ship home port. That study has suggested that we could yield 1,000 new jobs averaging $30,000 a year and more than $90 million a year in economic impact to our community. A major component of that possibility is directly relinked to public transit and how we move people around in and out of the community and to the ships. Without public transit, these type of opportunities would not, would not exist. So again, these are a few examples. I have some others from some of the markets, from some of the markets um, that I work with. Um, I got held up the three minute sign, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna give my time to my next speaker here, but I do appreciate being here with you today. Great, thanks, Tony. What a powerful story in terms of looking at the enormous potential that, that is there that weaves together all of those needs and the enormous economic development potential. Our last speaker uh, before we open it up for Q&A is Scott Bogren, who is a communications director for the Community Transportation Association of America. And he is also the editor of uh, Community Transportation Magazine and uh, also edits Rail Magazine. So Scott has been with uh, Community Transportation Association since 1988 and has served in a variety of capacities uh, there. And uh, the magazine has grown a lot under his uh, tutorship and uh, making it uh, uh, one of the leading uh, transit publications in the country. So I, Scott brings another very useful and interesting perspective to our session this afternoon. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Carol, and thanks, uh, John Michael, for the uh, invitation today to speak. <clears throat> Before I start, I wanted to also uh, uh, Less than two weeks ago, our board of directors met in Savannah, Georgia, of all places. And as a welcome, they sent down somebody from City Hall down, down to us at River Street. And I met this gentleman. And uh, uh, so he, he welcomed us to Savannah. So I'd like to welcome you to Washington. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. I, I doubt you'll have as much fun here as I had in Savannah. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, I don't know. Yes, it is. We'll, we'll get to that later. The, um, I'm here to talk a little bit about how tr 
transit and economic development overlap for smaller communities and in rural parts of the country. Um, the association that I work for, uh, we, we have about 4,000 members around the country. Uh, we deal uh, largely with those types of issues. And though they're very similar to what you've heard, um, they're uh, kind of more scalable and a little bit, a little bit uh, uh, different types of impact. And I think the impacts in a lot of those communities when it comes to passengers and the outcomes from trips are just as important economic development-wise as is bricks and mortar. And I'll talk a little bit about that, give you some strategies that, that we see happening in uh, rural and small urban uh, communities, and then I'll uh, talk about some of uh, the work that our members are doing. I'll try to do that as uh, quickly as possible. In rural communities, you will find buildings, you'll find brick and mortar, you'll find transit-oriented development. Uh, it's maybe not the same as you're going to see here in Boston, but it, 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 it has an impact nonetheless. And when it comes to passengers, uh, we find that a lot of the economic development is, is livability. It's aging in place. It's access to health care. It's access to jobs. And it's regional approaches that um, are, are, are sticking and, and making an impact in, in, in smaller cities and in rural communities. And I have a couple of maps uh, that I wanted to uh, show you here. And I also wanted to act like I was a weatherman. Uh, I've always wanted to do that. Um, this one here, we were talking about um, gasoline prices. The orange and yellow colors indicate where folks spend the highest percentage of their income on gas. And you can see where folks are spending 16 percent and higher is in, is in rural communities. Um, not surprising if you really think about it. They've got uh, longer distances to travel. They have uh, oftentimes less fuel efficient vehicles, older vehicles. Um, so as gas prices rise, the impact for folks living in those parts of the country is significant. Um, like in other parts of the country, rural communities have seen unemployment uh, rise dramatically, uh, not, not, not unlike what we're seeing in urban communities. And lastly, the population shift is really an important aspect of what we've seen. Um, and the impact of that is kind of, uh, 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 I, I like Nat's term, counterfactual. Um, you might think that when a area loses population, the transportation need it goes down. But actually what we find in a lot of these rural communities is when the population decreases, the mobile folks in the community are leaving and leaving behind the less mobile aspects of the community, seniors, people with disabilities. And so all of a sudden the need actually increases. As, so so uh, that's one thing we, we definitely see. And you can see this is why regional approaches to transportation are so important because towns that used to have a hospital, now there's a regional hospital that may be 40 miles down the road. And I've done work in places like South Dakota where a dialysis trip one way is an hour and a half, two hours one way to get to the closest dialysis clinic. These are significant economic development in that those folks can live and remain in their homes. Uh, I thought uh, 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 Gary also uh, touched on some of that. When folks don't have to leave work to take somebody three times a week to dialysis, but the transportation is there to do that. There's an economic uh, multiplier on a lot of that. Go back to the front here so you don't have to look at these maps. Um, so what are the strategies? For us, it's connectivity, first and foremost. And that's really the history of this country when you talk about transportation, where rivers and paths and then roads and rails and ports, where you have those intersections, that's where economic development happens. That's where uh, we think that uh, the future lies for uh, public transportation. If you, if you look at it in some ways uh, uh, from a transportation history, uh, you know, we've just finished the Eisenhower Highway Development Program. We've built in the last 40 years um, a, a lot of excellent 
transportation systems, uh, transit systems. Now we need to connect those all together in seamless ways, in common sense ways, and in ways that attract both business and passengers. And when all of those things happen, absolutely economic development will happen. In rural communities, um, we're very concerned about connectivity because um, we're losing a lot of it. Uh, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics had a 2011 study that showed that um, 8.9 million rural residents now lack any access to inner city transportation. It's 11 percent of the rural population. Uh, between 2005 and 2010, in that five-year span, 3.5 million rural residents lost access to a form of inner city transportation, rail, bus, those, those, types, those types of things. So, you know, as we start to think about connecting these things back together, we need to not forget the folks that are living in, in, in these smaller towns and in rural America where airports are often not so handy and, and where bus, rail, and transit all kind of intersect. Another strategy that we, we've been focusing on is livability. And, and for us, in many rural communities, that means preserving Main Street and, and maybe um, working on that train or bus station that may, may have uh, sat fallow in, in, the, uh, in the community for years and bringing that back to life and then bringing these inner city services and these regional services through those. And frankly, connecting those services into places like DART and Dallas. And I'm sure Gary could, could speak very eloquently of how some of the outlying communities and rural communities link in because Dallas is a job center. Dallas is a health care center. This, this, this all works. Um, aging in place. For seniors, that's critical. And, and everybody here, we are all going to say, you know, I don't want to be, no one wants to be prematurely institutionalized, yet it's a lack of transportation more than anything else that leads precisely to premature institutionalization. So outcomes. We're talking about healthier communities. We're talking about economic development. Uh, we're talking about uh, issues that, that can, can lead to um, uh, communities growing and transit being an active part of that. I'll give you some of the examples, and I have, I have uh, many. But uh, I'll, I'll be quick with these. Um, in Spearfish, South Dakota, uh, recently built a brand new uh, transit facility, an intermodal transit facility. Spearfish is about 40, 50 miles up the road uh, uh, from Rapid City, which is in Spearfish, Rapid City is the big city. Um, it's, a, it's a great facility. They've got joint uh, maintenance. So a lot of the other municipal maintenance is all done there. You've got the inner city bus carrier right along I-90, pulls right into the station. So you've got uh, a connection to the outside world for Spearfish. You've got a lot of non-emergency medical transportation, uh, dialysis trips, all organized and run out of this facility. And I think kind of neat, they've also got a daycare center there. So folks that are moving in and out. You know, um, these are the kinds of ideas that are happening in a place like Spearfish. In, um, the Menominee uh, Tribal Reservation in Menominee, Wisconsin, which is a little bit northwest of uh, Green Bay. Uh, the Menominee Tribe actually encompasses the entirety of Menominee County. 3,200 people live in the county. The, the, the tribal system has a very effective transit system. For a population of 3,200, they, they estimate that they serve 90% of those residents. They provide 80,000 trips a year to 3,200 people. Um, they've just built a brand new transit, transit center that houses a lot of the Indian health service um, uh, services, which draw a lot of people in. It also houses retail. And an important thing for the tribe, and when I've talked to some of the tribal elders, is it actually also serves outside of the reservation. And that way, uh, whether you're going to specialize health care, employment opportunities, folks can live on the reservation live with their families, go access that, come back, bring those paychecks, and, and keep living the way they want to. Um, Normal, Illinois, has, uh, is, is, is a town that has two universities, uh, large corporate headquarters, State Farm Insurance, uh, Mitsubishi's only North American 
uh, plant is in normal and has the second busiest rail station in Illinois. Does 180,000 rides a year out of normal, and they are um, building a new intermodal transit center that's going to be even bigger, and part of what they're building onto that in a place like it is a hotel and a conference center that are just, they look really like they're going to be uh, top notch. Uh, Central Massachusetts, uh, uh, Fitchburg, uh, and, and Greenfield. Fitchburg just built a rail station that's connected to Boston's commuter line. And what that allows is uh, uh, my folks all live in Boston, and um, they refer to Fitchburg and Greenfield as those towns out west, kind of like Denver or Salt Lake City. That's kind of their mentality in the Boston area. But, but regardless, um, people can live in Fitchburg now, and an hour and a half later, access the job-rich Boston and Boston suburbs areas works very well. Um, they're expecting four to 600 passengers a day. And the local ski slope, uh, Mount Wachusets, I was worried I wasn't going to be able to pronounce that one, um, actually has set up a shuttle to run and pick up, you know, economic development-wise, move skiers right from the train up to the slopes. And that, that's happening right now. Greenfield is uh, a little bit further west of Fitchburg, so it's, it's it would be way out west to my parents. And uh, Greenfield is also, uh, this month, going to be um, uh, cutting the ribbon on a brand new bus uh, facility in downtown Greenfield. And as I was just looking at uh, newspaper stories this morning, I couldn't help but notice a headline that said, Transit, a catalyst for revitalization of Greenfield. And I thought, well, I, I should carry that headline along today. And lastly, uh, yesterday at, at one of the APTA sessions, I was talking to a, a friend of mine uh, who runs the transit system in Monterey, Salinas. And, you know, smaller community, Monterey is about 30,000 population, certainly near larger urban areas. Um, but you wouldn't expect that Monterey has uh, that transit system, has absolutely the most astounding military commuter program in the country. They started this program for active duty military personnel in the Santa Clara County and, and in Monterey. Uh, they had uh, 7,000 riders when they started the program in 2009. Uh, as of last week, uh, Carl let me know that they now do 46,000 rides a month. So Carl's here in town because he is very interested in the commuter tax benefit being continued. It's a very important part. But what does that do in the community? That reduces uh, vehicle miles traveled by 2.5 million miles on, on these 16 bus routes that they're running moving uh, military personnel. So there's a lot of really good work. And these are just some of the examples in smaller cities that, that is, is scalable. It's not, it doesn't rival the, the big numbers that we saw with, with, with Nat's presentation. But to those folks living in those communities, it's just as meaningful. And um, I'm looking forward to answering any questions you might have. Thanks. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for very, very thoughtful presentations in terms of really looking at how important transportation and the whole role of transit is to Americans across the country, no matter where we live, and in terms of what that means for all of us economically as well for our communities and for us as individuals. Let's open it up for any questions or comments. And if you could just identify yourself, please. We'll start in the back. Well, that's probably the question for the day, right? Uh, to see what, who wants to, oh, okay. anybody want to talk? And just turn on your mic. No. Okay, Scott first. There you go. I guess. 
Or did you want to say something? I agree with you. Uh, and it's a shame. I know that in the Senate, we've had a couple of uh, uh, brief interludes of uh, uh, some senators offering up at least the idea of indexing the gas tax, but that amendment never actually gets put into the hopper. It's pulled back pretty quickly. Uh, but it's nice to see that discussion going on because I, I would agree with you. And uh, uh, the message that I know we have carried uh, for, for years is the gas tax allows us to invest in ourselves, invest in our own transportation future. And, and, and the, the, the members that I talk to are very fearful of higher gas prices because they know what it means. It means more riders. It means increased demand at a time when they're very concerned whether or not they'll be able to meet that demand. And they're also very concerned that you get a lot of first-time transit riders whose, whose uh, impression isn't going to be as good as they'd like it to be because the equipment is old. The, 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 you know, uh, a lot of the issues that I'm sure you're very familiar with. So I, I, I appreciate the, the question. Uh, if, I, if, I could, if I had a vote, I could tell you how I'd vote. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, as far as uh, the appropriate funding mechanisms, I, that's not really what I wanted to, to, to speak to. I guess I just wanted to expand on the point that the, the, the map, the graphic that Scott was showing before about the, the, the share of income that goes to, to gas taxes. And actually, just to repeat a fact that I heard um, from folks from the, the UITP, the International Transit Union, um, on a trip to Belgium in December, which was basically they keep a de database. Uh, well, so my point is I think the important perspective is how to – uh, to build regional transportation systems that protect people from big variations in the price of gasoline. And, you know, one of the things that they have in their database is a comparison of the total expenditure on transportation in different uh, metro regions around the world, ranging from places like Houston, where it's 12 percent of the GDP, to places like Tokyo or Hong Kong, where it's, you know, it's, it's 6 percent. And in economic terms, that, the difference is about $2,500 per person. Uh, per year, and so when uh, you know um, that gets to the point of are we you know are some regions over providing transportation? Are they making it too costly for households to uh, compared to uh, an alternative regional transportation system that maybe requires less expenditure of household income in aggregate to meet daily transport needs? And I think you can argue that some of these um, places that are spending less per capita on total transportation to meet their daily needs. Uh, you know, they're, they're places that have higher gas, gasoline taxes, but they're much, much more protected against uh, the price of gasoline going up or down. And again, I wouldn't uh, necessarily offer an opinion on, on how they ought to, uh, while I have one, certainly, uh, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't necessarily get into how they ought to uh, do that. We can, I mean, we can talk about that all afternoon, and folks have talked about that all afternoon. Uh, for months now, and it, it hadn't gone anywhere. I think, uh, from my perspective, though, what I think we really need to do is offer public transportation as a solution, uh, in part, in part to the higher gas prices. Uh, I think there, as I said uh, earlier, um, there was a, a great story on ABC yesterday that almost got us there, um, and we just need to to make that push. You know, every day. Uh, there's 4.2 billion gallons of gasoline saved annually, the equivalent, the equivalent of 900,000 automobile fill-ups on a daily basis uh, from people riding public transit. So I think uh, I think that's one of the real opportunities is as gas prices go up, uh, whoever's profiting from them and why they're doing that, and we can we can all uh, we can all speculate. But uh, I think the the real from my perspective, the real message is to get people out of their cars and onto public transit. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, here, and then back there.
a level playing field. I'm curious as to the jurisdictions that won't put in transit, are they putting in roads? Or what is the reluctance to, to spend the money? Or should the federal government, because of all these ultimate benefits, should some leadership, as the Count Conference on Mayors did in, 19, in the 1980s, oppose some of our foreign policy priorities and try and shift the money and the priorities to domestic needs? There's no leadership doing that today. Do you want to? Okay. I don't know. You know, I don't know about Maryland and, and Washington. It's such a long question, I can't repeat it. <laughs> but uh, um, I don't know about Maryland or Washington. I think in the metro, metro areas, it's a much different animal. But I know that in the markets that I'm involved in, there is a lack of understanding of, of what transit serves. And I believe that there are some racial prejudices that govern how transit is looked at in those markets. And, I, and it hurts. It, it hurts the community. It hurts economic development. And that's, in my remarks, that's what I was referring to as image. I think that the image of transit is not being sub substandard, but really a viable way of moving and getting people connected, you know, around. And we've got to stop thinking of just cities. You know, regions have become the new cities now. And if, if folks are still on a, a, a thought plane that it's my city, um, they're going to lose in the end because regions have to connect to be competitive in this new world um, global economy that we're dealing with. And, and, and I just I think a lot of it has to do with the overall image and perception of folks who don't understand what transit is which is also very different from what we've been experiencing when you're talking about transit is the way people want to go and demands. Yeah, no, I just, I just essentially wanted to agree with that statement. People um, have re very reflexive uh, responses to what they should invest in. And as long as the, the prevailing idea is that the automobile is freedom and the automobile is, you know, I can move whenever I want to, wherever I want to, that's the reflect. That's going to drive people's reflexive impulses. But there's a whole generational difference, and there's a lot of people who think, uh, you know, I want to move to a city, and walking is what I can do. That's the ultimate freedom. Or just grabbing a bike and going someplace is the freedom, and that'll get me closer to where I want to go. And it's, um, you know, it's very difficult to figure out from a policy perspective how to create a reflexive reaction on people's uh, mindset. But I mean, that's what. We have advertising firms for and marketing budgets. And there you go. <laughs> so you just need to do more with that whole aspect of your of uh, your job, right? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm doing my job. Uh, <laughs> Did you want to add anything? You, you know, I, and, and you stated it that uh, that he understands that that uh, roads are not self sufficient, but I, I'm not sure everybody does all the time. I think there's some uh, some folks throughout the country that still think roads are self-sufficient and that transit isn't and and we ought to be more like the highway system and and that's one of our challenges is just communication and education roads are not self-sufficient and we all know that and and it's not free to build roads and uh, and as a matter of fact in in Texas one of the while we used to have a great highway system the problem we have now is we can't maintain what we have with the gas tax that we have, and the state is starting to realize that. And again, just just uh, realizing what our mindset has been for so long, people in our state are starting to realize that we can't build our way out of this using roads, uh, and continue to compete, and continue to compete with other cities around the country and around the world. Okay, back here. Mm -hmm. development because I think that's one of the items that we're trying to get across from a public transportation standpoint. But you mentioned to do the work that would be replicatable. Have other places around the country, around the world, adopted the same uh, techniques? You know, is there any chance those could be implemented in a systematic <coughs> way? So we, we just finished this up in October and um, uh, there's uh, Montgomery County is a suburban jurisdiction here in the Washington D.C. region. They're thinking about doing a 150-mile rapid bus network, 
And uh, one of the first things that they actually realized as this task force was deliberating um, uh, how to build the case for it was that they need to make a, a, an economic case for it. And it was just uh, good luck that we had the scope of work available for that. I shared it with the folks on the task force, and they basically said, uh, you know, we want to use this exactly as as is, and they've 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 moved forward on that. I was very heartened by that. It, that there was that that sort of uh, immediate appeal. Then in this region in December, there was a bit of a, a media squall about how much money we spent on this study. Um, but uh, some folks picked up to our defense at the Atlantic Cities and at TBD.com, which are uh, blogs in, in in the area. And I was also heartened that the Boston Globe picked up on that. They were tracking that debate, and they're having they have a real budget issue there. They have raised fares. I think it's forty percent, six percent was some, one of the proposals there. Uh, and the Globe editorialized on the basis of this study, and they said, "Look, the, the 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 MBTA should do the same kind of analysis because all this shouldn't be burdened on the backs of of the strap hangers." Um, in fact, that was the title of the of the editorial was not for strap hangers only. So. What I'm seeing is that this kind of approach is really appealing, and I think that over the APTA legislative conference over the last couple of days, there have been people who have expressed interest in looking at that scope of work and talking about how to replicate it in other cities as well. So I think there's an appetite for it. Great. Any other last comments or questions? Any closing remarks from anybody? Any other points that any of you wanted to get out? Go ahead. I just want to let people know we have about 25 brochures here that that detail the um, the findings and uh, cover some ground that I didn't have time for in the presentation. So if anyone is looking for that, we we'll have them up here. Great, terrific. Okay, and the presentations will be on EESI's website. And so I want to thank our speakers very, very much um, for such thoughtful um, uh, presentations. And hopefully, this will be very, very useful to everyone in terms of moving forward your particular work with regard to thinking about how transit fits into how we need to think about overall transportation and economic development and simply better livability and better competition uh, across the country. Thank you very, very much.